Stocks declined for the fifth time in six days. Joining us by phone is Tom Lee, head of research at Fundstrat. And Tom, I know you've said and called this sell-off extremely healthy because it's months overdue and it's not in response to worsening fundamentals and that it's a reaction or recalibration to the fact that central banks, including the Federal Reserve, is moving away from uh, the excessive easing we've seen in the past. The higher interest rates is also healthy. At what point, though, could it get unhealthy? Um, well, in, in some ways, since 1980, markets have generally favored lower rates, right? So we know that uh, higher rates scare people, and it, it seemed like 2.7% was a break point uh, this year because rates have been rising since August of last year. I, I, I'd say if we did something as simple as look at uh, where do rates hit a level that scare markets, it seems like it's followed a trend line from 80, from 1980 to now, where the 2000, 2007, you know, 87, and, and uh, have bumped up against this line, and that's when markets get concerned. So that number would be like 375 today. But mm. I think that we're really in a world where higher inflation is actually good for stocks now because we're we it's going to help reset reflation expectations it's going to help corporate profits it's going to actually help the deficit because higher rates along with a progressive tax system means um high inflation means government budget deficits actually will shrink so i think this is a more of a 1950 to 1975 period where five of the big rallies in that 25-year period all occurred when rates were rising so as much as it feels like it's a bad thing now, I think we're going to look back and realize that higher rates are actually good. It should also be good for consumers too, shouldn't it, if we get paid a bit more as well, Tom? The problem is, as you say, we're going to look back on this and say it was a good thing. How long before we can look back and go it was a good thing? I mean, investors at the moment are concerned, well, nervous. Yeah. I mean, this week's really, uh, you know, this thing, this week's created a, a bit of turmoil. Part of it is because of what's happened to some volatility products. And part of it's because the market's now just essentially repricing risk, and, and I think that's really healthy. I mean, it's, you know, we don't really want to live in a low-vol world because P.E. would go to infinity. <laughs> um, but um, so I think we have to deal with, uh, you know, people de-risking. Um, you know, there's actually systematic uh, liquidations that are taking place now. But mm. when I look at the VIX uh, term structure, so not just spot VIX, but what the future VIX is saying, I think the worst of it's behind us. Like, I... I I, I don't think that I don't think we're actually going to make new lows, even though it's been sloppy the last two days. So we, I would still consider this to be a dip you have to buy. Explain that, Tom. What do you mean by the term structure is telling you that we've seen the worst of it now and it's passed? Yeah. So normally, uh, when you look at VIX, and VIX, remember, is not just a spot market. It's it's a series of futures contracts that expire, and you can even look many many months out. Normally, it's positively sloping, meaning that historically yes. you expect VIX to be higher in the future. Today, the spot and the one-month contracts are way above the four-month contract. In other words, the market's pricing in a very big volatility spike within the next 30 days. That's every time that's happened since 2004, when the first contract started, it occurs near market bottoms. But the magnitude of that inversion on Monday was the largest since November 2008. And, and November 2008, as you all recall, was the structural low of the S&P in, right. in that huge bear market. So, Tom, let me ask you, because we were speaking about this with Rachel Evans earlier uh, of Bloomberg News, who wrote about how the spotlight is now on these uh, ETF problem children. We've seen the XIV kind of blow up, and um, we're worried or we're thinking maybe that there are going to be other ETPs that are similarly designed that could uh, similarly see a big plunge, an unexpected plunge, a rush for the exits. Do you share that concern that there might be other problems lurking beneath the surface here? Um, well, you know, one of the problems w with uh, financial markets is that many innovative products often come with uh, surprising uh, problems because you're never really getting rid of volatility. You're either pushing it out or you're raising amplitude. Hmm. Um, so I, I'm not surprised um, that in a low vol world, especially because last year really seemed to anchor it, right? Inflation fell and VIX fell and 
And as you know, um, implicitly when VIX falls, a lot of other behaviors take hold. I- I'm sure that there is uh, some other, you know, grossly uh, dangerous instruments out there. But I don't think it poses systematic risk. Um, just because, as you know, post-2008, I mean, financial en- entities just aren't as levered as they used to be. So it's not like the f- it's not like a forest fire that has no firewall. The firewalls are going to you know, stop with the banks now and the brokers and the exchanges because leverage is much lower. Yeah, interesting. Tom, I also want to just talk about this on a global basis as well, because we are seeing a repricing of rates in Europe. We had the Bank of England today, Governor Mark Carney, saying they may need to raise rates quicker than expected. They actually raised their growth forecast, which we could see uh, as a positive here too. Just when you look globally as a result of this, do you see opportunities as a result of the repricing here that we've already seen? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I think we're we're certainly shattering 10 years of, uh, hey, I'm willing to own negative interest rate bonds. Remember, at the peak, $20 trillion of bonds had a negative interest rate. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, but I think more importantly, we're probably reversing 30-plus years of expecting lower interest rates. This is a huge, huge shift, I think, towards value-style investing. To me, the biggest lesson in 2018 and the one that we're urging our clients to focus on is you've got to shift away from focus on growth and, and focus on sectors and industries that benefit from higher rates. Mm-hmm. And, and that's more value-style investing. Because um, it takes a whole lot of E to offset a PE contraction. So it's better to focus on things where the E goes up because of higher rates. Okay, so if we go towards uh, more value sectors then, does that mean they're going to be in the U.S. and we're looking at the, the likes of uh, utilities, staples, or are we going abroad where there hasn't been as much froth or a little bit less froth in some of those asset prices? Yeah, the, a- the answer is a bit of both. I mean, I think the commodity complex is a huge winner. And, you know, last year we said energy was making a generational low. Mm-hmm. And in a generation we'll find out. But I think that means you want to be overweight energy and materials. That's a lot of EM and a lot of commodity producing countries. Financials are huge winners, especially U.S. banks. Um, I do think capital spending benefits and industrials because of their exposure to the commodity complex is a winner. And then I think wage inflation means old tech, you know, automation, SaaS, those are really great businesses and ones that demand will grow. So, you know, our sector theme this year is is ICRAP. It's an acronym for the value and commodity sensitive groups.